Hello, ladies. Wow, it's so good to see all of you today. I'm Deb Haygood, part of the Women in the Word teaching team. So glad to be here, and I'm so glad you are here. I'm studying the Gospel of Matthew, the good news story of Jesus Christ, the King who came to earth to bring us life and to in usher in his kingdom, the kingdom of God, or as Matthew likes to call it, the kingdom of heaven. You know, we've said that now it is a kingdom of the heart. Jesus reigns in the lives of believers. So as believers in Jesus, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. So what does that kingdom of God look like? What are the principles and standards that govern the kingdom of heaven? What are we to do in the kingdom of heaven? Well, Jesus tells us all about the kingdom of heaven and how we're to be a part of it and participate in it in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, um, I don't know how many of you, I love this part of the Bible because it's uh, all Jesus' words. Uh, and in my Bible, they're written in red. How many of you have your words of Jesus typed in red in your Bibles? Okay, then you have, in chapters 5, 6, and 7, you have two pages somewhere that look like this all red. I used to love this as a little kid. I would, I would turn in my Bible to find these pages. All red. These are the words of Jesus. It's just Jesus speaking. I love that. I don't know how many of you remember those bracelets that we had in the late 90s. Some of you that are young may have worn them. I know my kids wore them. They got them in the youth group. It had WWJD. What would Jesus do? Um, people thought of that. It was kind of clever for a while. You know, I wish I had bracelets for each one of you today, and on it would be WDJS. What does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? Because today we are going to look at what Jesus has to say about his kingdom and how we can participate in it. Shelley taught the first part of Jesus' sermon last week, and we saw a picture of kingdom life, the blessedness, the inner contented happiness of those who are part of the kingdom. And we also saw the standards and the ideals, the precepts that will govern his kingdom. And this was new news for them. This was nothing they had ever heard before. It was very different from what the Jewish religious leaders were teaching them. In fact, in some cases, it was the very opposite. Today, we are going to study the second half of the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to listen as Jesus tells us about the practice of kingdom life. What do we do in the kingdom? How are we to act? How do we live in the kingdom of God as kingdom citizens? You know, the theme over the whole Sermon on the Mount is righteousness. It's righteousness. Shelley told us last week that the kingdom of heaven requires true righteousness. And when we open up chapter 6 of Matthew, we look at verse 1 and we read this. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. Jesus starts out talking once again about righteousness. So let's talk a minute about righteousness. What is righteousness? Well, last week we saw that um, righteousness is required for the kingdom of heaven, and it comes from God when we choose to believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, our Redeemer. We accept that it's his blood shed on the cross that covers our sin, and we are made righteous before God. Now, last week we looked at Romans um, 3, and I've got that on your verse sheet again. You can look at that. I just want you to look at that last part after the hyphen. It says, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Now, sometimes we call that positional righteousness. We are made righteous through faith in Jesus, and nothing changes that for us. Nothing will change it. We are saved from death. We are glory bound. One day we will be in heaven living forever with Jesus. But in verse 1 in chapter 6 right here, we saw Jesus talking about practicing righteousness. What does that mean? Well, it is practicing what we believe. It's living out our faith in Jesus. Some people say it's walking the talk. It is doing right things. That God declares right. It's not what I say is right. It's not what you say is right or what the world says is right. It's those things that God declares right. So righteousness means that which is in harmony with the will of God. 
Righteousness is that which is in harmony with the will of God. And righteous deeds are doing those deeds that are pleasing to God. Now, we do not do righteous deeds to obtain salvation. I want to say that right up front. We do not do righteous acts to obtain salvation. We practice our righteousness because we are saved. We have salvation. Now, we don't um, practice righteousness because we want to be accepted by Jesus. We are accepted by Jesus. He loves us. He touches us. We believe in him, and we want to walk through life with him. That is practicing righteousness. Now, God makes us righteous, and listen to this. Our righteous deeds are done through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Our righteous deeds are done through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Paul gives this good news to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So I've divided these um, words of Jesus in chapter 6 and 7 into four sections. And uh, this is where Jesus tells us um, what we need to know what we need to be aware of as we practice righteousness, or as I like to say, walk with Jesus in the kingdom. And the first thing you need to um, know, the first thing we need to have to practice righteousness, the right motive. And what is that motive? So let's look, let's dive in here, chapter 6. I'm going to start with verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. And look at verse 3. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Verse 5, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And then drop down to verse 16, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, They have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So Jesus is giving us here three examples of righteous acts or righteous deeds. Giving to the poor, prayer, and fasting. And he picks these three deeds because they were considered to be, um, by the religious leaders, to be the three chief acts of righteousness. Now, Jesus isn't saying, don't do these things. In fact, he says, when you do these, these are good things. We should do them. Verse 3, but when you give to the needy. Verse 5, and when you pray. Verse 16, and when you fast. These are good things, and we should do them. Sometimes, by the way, we call these righteous deeds today spiritual disciplines. And we practice spiritual disciplines to enhance our relationship uh, with God so that we can grow closer to him, we can rely on him in every situation, trust him in all ways. We don't do it for um, salvation. We do it because we love him. And there are other disciplines. Study, which is what you're doing right here. The discipline of studying the word. There's the discipline of meditation and service and worship and secrecy, as well as fasting, prayer, and giving to the needy. But Jesus says you can do good things with the wrong motive. The right motive is doing it unto the Lord. So we do these things to bring glory to God, to worship God, because you love God. Your whole heart is focused on God. This is a pure heart. That's what we talked about last week with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart. They are focused totally on God. Now the Pharisees, uh, the religious leaders, God, Jesus calls them hypocrites here, they have the wrong motivation. 
They're not doing these things for the glory of God. They're doing it to bring glory to themselves. And so they um, live out their acts of righteousness. They do these acts of righteous living before men to get their praise from people, from boys and girls and men and women. And Jesus also calls them hypocrites, we see here. And that word hypocrite comes from the Greek. It means actor. And they were acting like they were giving God glory, but really they wanted the glory for themselves. They wanted the praise from men. They wanted people to think, oh, how spiritual and how holy are they. So Jesus says, don't blow a trumpet when you're giving. Don't bring attention to yourself when you're giving. Do it in secret. When no one's watching. Now, I love this phrase because my granny, um, she was a Bible-reading, God-fearing, great gal who loved me dearly, and she spoke the truth. And so I can remember when I was a little girl, and sometimes when I was older, she would say, Debbie, don't toot your own horn. And what she meant by that was, you are bragging. Don't bring attention to yourself. Don't toot your own horn. And I love it when I see this in the Word, because I know this is where she got it. When Jesus says, don't blow a trumpet when you're giving. Give. It's a good thing. But do it when no one is watching. Give to the poor and don't announce it. Do it because you love God and do it for his glory. And it's the same with prayer. Don't pray in front of people with lots of fancy, um, you know, spiritual words, babbling on and on, praying on. Um, Praying is talking to God. And prayer is a good thing. And even praying in public is a good thing. But prayer is connecting to God. So when you're praying in front of people, remember, you are talking to God. You're not just speaking for other people. One bit of advice said, first pray much in private, then pray in front of others. And I thought that was so good. Pray much in private, then pray in front of others. And once again, we see Jesus saying in verse 6, pray in secret. And then he gives us a third example, and that is fasting. And once again, the Pharisees um, were hypocrites, and so they made a big show of their fasting. They would put ashes on their face, and their hair was unkempt, and they would stand there, and everybody would walk by and think, they're fasting today. Oh, how holy and spiritual they are. Now, fasting, by the way, is denying yourself something physical so that you can spend time with the Lord. So you can use that time focusing on God. Usually, we spend it in time with God praying, maybe asking um, him to help us understand something. Maybe we want wisdom in a certain decision, or maybe we just want to get closer to the Lord. And so we take that time and focus on him. And we usually think of fasting having to do with food, giving up cooking and and eating food and taking that time and spending it with the Lord. But really, we can fast from anything that's physical. We can fast from the TV. We can fast from shopping. We can fast... Goodness gracious. We can fast... (laughs) from many things that are physical and spend that time focused on the Lord. We do that, Jesus says, in secret, for goodness sake. Don't moan and groan and tell everybody about your fasting. You do it in secret before the Lord. Don't let others know. Don't announce it. That is the right motive, doing it unto the Lord. And guess what else Jesus says? There are rewards for our righteous deeds. Now, if you do it before men, then you get their praise and acclaim. That's your reward. But if you do it in secret unto the Lord with a pure heart, then you're going to get a reward from God. And his reward is perfect and it's eternal. And which one do you want? The words from men that are nice today but forgotten tomorrow or that eternal, perfect reward from our Heavenly Father. And then, right in the middle of these acts of righteousness, talking about prayer, Jesus gives us a prayer. And we got to look at that for a few seconds. It's commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. I think we're all very familiar with it. It really is the disciples' prayer, because this was a model prayer that Jesus was giving us. Um, These words help us to know how to pray. It's a pattern for prayer. Not that we have to say these words exactly. It's a pattern for how we pray. And he begins, verse 9, he says, Pray like this. 
our Father in heaven. Okay, right there. Picture everyone on the hillside listening to Jesus with their eyes wide open and their mouth dropped open because this was a very surprising thing to hear. Father was an intimate name, and they did not call God Father. They'd never heard this before. And so Jesus is saying that with this new inner righteousness comes an intimate relationship with God, and we can call him Father. Now, that doesn't mean much to us today because we've grown up calling him Father, but that would have been new to them. That would have really pointed out this intimate relationship we now have with God. And then Jesus goes on to say, uh, pray with reverence and worship and a desire for God's will to be done. Verse 10, oh, verse 9 says, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our first priority is that God's will be done. So the first part of the prayer is all about God. And praying like this would take humility and submission to God. And the rest of the prayer, then, is centered around us, our personal needs. And the first one we read, give us this day our daily bread. It's those physical needs that we have, um, food, shelter, clothing, those daily needs that we need every day. And then second, it is a spiritual need. Twelve, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, forgiveness is very important in the kingdom of God. We need forgiveness from God, and then we need to forgive others. It's a two-way street. We demonstrate being forgiven by forgiving others, and it's not always easy. In fact, I think it's rarely easy, and that's why Jesus may have included it in the prayer here, to remind us of the importance of forgiveness. And then we have one final petition here. If verse 13 says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, God does not lead us into temptation. That comes from Satan. But God can give us guidance and endurance and deliverance from temptation. In fact, I love when Paul tells the Corinthians on your verse sheet, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. We're to remember to ask God for endurance and deliverance from temptation. And then, did you notice, because forgiveness is so important, Jesus says a little bit more about it. And because these verses can sometimes trip us up, let's, let's read those. Verse 14, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Okay, what does that mean? Well, one thing, Jesus is not talking about withdrawing or taking back the forgiveness of sin that we receive when we believe in Jesus. Instead, he's saying we need to express the forgiveness we receive by a willingness to forgive others. A willingness to forgive others. And refusing to do that is wrong. And... It gets in the way of our intimate relationship with the Lord. So forgiving others is important in the kingdom of God. And this isn't the last time that we are going to see Matthew talk about forgiveness in this gospel of Matthew. So if you struggle with this, talk to God about it. The Holy Spirit can change your heart and give you what you need to forgive. Some of you out there may be thinking, Deb, you have no idea what I've been through. You cannot realize what this person has done to me. And you're right. There are some things I can't even imagine. But this I know. God is more powerful than that. And God can give you a spirit of forgiveness if you go to him. And then when you forgive, you are going to experience the joy that comes when you draw close to the Lord. Forgiveness is important in the kingdom of God. 
So as we practice righteousness, walking with Jesus our King, remember we must have the right motive. That right motive, doing everything unto the Lord. And to check and see if you have that right motive, practice the discipline of secrecy. Do it in secrecy, just before the Lord. Okay, next, Jesus is going to talk about two things that can get in the way of righteousness. And uh, it's amazing to me, those two things are materialism and worry. Can you believe Jesus is teaching 2,000 years ago on a Galilean hillside about two things that we struggle with today? Or maybe I don't know about you, but I struggle with today. In fact, I can picture myself sitting on the grass at the feet of Jesus, listening to him talking about these two subjects that I feel very familiar with. Maybe you can picture that too. And I have a picture. Let's put that up. This is a picture of um, the Sea of Galilee. You see that? And then you see this green hillside. Many people think that this is where Jesus sat and taught the disciples and the um, other followers. Picture yourself there on that green grass listening to Jesus. And maybe a gentle breeze is blowing by. Maybe there's wildflowers in the distance. Birds are flying around. Maybe you can hear them singing. Picture yourself there as Jesus says these words. Verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. First thing Jesus talks about is materialism and he says we need the right perspective which leads to the right priority. Our perspective needs to be eternal. It needs to be heavenly. That's what lasts forever. What we have here on earth, our money, our possessions, our material things, they will not last. They fall apart. They get used up or they get burned up or they're stolen. They're left behind. They do not last. And what happens when we focus on our material possessions, collecting things or making money so that we can get more things? Our focus is taken off God. We're not focusing on him. We're fo focusing on those things. Now, let me say, it's not um, wrong to have things. It's not, that's not wrong in itself. But as we're, Warren Wiersbe says it like this, it's not wrong to possess things. It's wrong for things to possess us. And that's what happens when we are so focused on them. We want to have our heart focused on the Lord. Otherwise, these things can slip into adult, adultery. And I want <clears throat> idolatry. Excuse me. That, <laughs> that was last week's lesson, Shelley. <laughs> idolatry. That's what things can become in our life. All right, glad you're listening out there. Okay, <clears throat> let's read 1 Timothy. Uh, this is Paul writing to Timothy, and he tells him this. He's talking about the rich. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. Paul, right there, is referring back to these words of Jesus when he's talking about having eternal treasures. So when we focus on God... Um, those next verses that we didn't read, verse 22 and 23, talks about our eyes being full of light. They're open to the Lord, and we're filled with light. And we have direction, and we hold on to our stuff loosely. And so then we are generous with others. We can share our stuff with others because we're holding on to it loosely. We experience joy and peace focusing on the Lord. Our faith deepens. But when we focus on the worldly, those um, material things, our desires for those things um, block the light that comes to, into our eyes and we pretty soon are in darkness. And that darkness becomes more great and we become more materialistic and then we're actually greedy, wanting more things. And then we're coveting, we're wanting what everyone else has because we're never satisfied. Nothing is ever quite right. We're discontent never having enough, and we're miserable. And Jesus says, how great is that darkness? 
Verse 24 says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, this is something that each of us have to ask ourselves individually. We can't be looking at our neighbor or our friend and trying to figure out if they have a problem with materialism. This is about you. You have to ask yourself, what takes up my time and my thoughts and my efforts? Is it Jesus or is it collecting things? All right, let's move on. And now Jesus is going to talk about worry, verse 25. You know, worry, um, I think that's something that we all deal with, some of us more than others. Worry is that um, to feel anxious and troubled and distressed. So uh, let's look and see what Jesus says about that, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So Jesus says here, the cure for worry is the right perspective and the right priority. We have a heavenly father and he is good and he provides for us. He cares for his creation and we are part of that. You know, worry um, is really sin. It's sin and it's a disabling sin because worry causes us to distrust God. Our faith weakens because what we're saying is, um, I don't think God can take care of this, whatever this is. So our faith is weakening. And Jesus tells us that at the end of verse 30. He says, oh, you of little faith. The person that worries, he calls as one of little faith. Second, worry causes us to fear. And fear can paralyze us so that we don't even do those things that we could do to help the situation. Worry causes fear which paralyzes us and worry is futile it's useless it does not help in the least in fact verse 27 says which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life worry does nothing to help it is useless fourth it robs us of our joy today Instead of enjoying what we have today, we are worried. And verse 34 says, the worst thing is to worry about tomorrow. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Don't worry about tomorrow. Enjoy today. And then the fifth thing that it does, and I think this is the worst one of all, it destroys our testimony about God. It damages our testimony about God. And he tells us this in verse 31. He says, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? I wish he hadn't put that in there. (laughs) For the Gentiles seek after all these things. You know, the Gentiles were the unbelievers. They're the ones that didn't even know God. They're worried about these things. And so you're acting like an unbeliever, like you don't know God when you worry. It's like saying we don't, um, God's not mighty enough. God's not strong enough. He's not powerful enough. He doesn't care about me enough. We don't want to say that. We want to say our God is enough. He is sufficient. When I was five years old, I uh, went to vacation Bible school at my grandfather's church, and he lived in another state. And so at the end of the week, uh, when they were passing out awards, I got the award for coming the farthest to Vacation Bible School. And it was this little plaque, and it was so cool. I had it on my wall the entire time I was growing up, took it to college, and I still have it today. (laughs) Love that little plaque, first award I ever got. It had little birds engraved on it, and this is what it said. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think that it must be. They have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. We do have a heavenly father 
and he cares for us. And Jesus sums it up with verse 33 when he says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He's telling us here, have an eternal perspective. Seek God and his kingdom and do it first. That's the right priority. Seek God first. Now, seek means to desire, to think about. Desire God. Remember who he is and what he's done, how he works. God is good and gracious. He's powerful and mighty. And if you sort of are having trouble, something comes and gets in the way of you remembering who he is, go back and look at Psalm 103 or Psalm 145 and meditate on that. Remember who he is and what he's done. Seek him first, and he says, and all these things will be added to you. What you need will come to you. Try it. Let's try it. So let's go on now, and we're going to look at uh, what we need for righteousness. That's living in harmony with God's will. And the, what we're going to learn now, Jesus tells us, is a right attitude. Chapter 7 Verse 1, judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see that speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Okay, um, that verse there, verse 1, judge not, I read that that is the most quoted verse um, in the world today from the Bible. Most quoted verse in the world today, and most of the time it is taken out of context. What Jesus is saying, um, what this means does not mean that we never evaluate or analyze or um, determine right from wrong. That's not what he's saying. Instead, Jesus is saying, as citizens of the kingdom, we should not have a self-righteous, critical spirit and condemning attitude toward others. You know, a judgmental, judgmental, critical spirit is the exact opposite of a loving attitude. Instead, we should have an attitude of humility first, seeing ourselves clearly, first looking at ourselves, examining our own shortcomings and failings and wrongdoings. You know, it's so easy to see the sin in someone else. Um, that's the speck when we have a gigantic log in our own eye. We have this major shortcoming in our own life that we don't even see. How many times have I sat in church next to my um, sweet husband and I'm thinking as the preacher talks, whoa, I hope Scott is listening. He really needs that. I hope he hears it. Ladies, I need to hear that. I'm the one that needs to be listening and looking and thinking about the log that is in my own eye. It takes discernment, and it takes careful consideration of yourself before you ever deal with someone else. And maybe those times are few and far between. It won't even come. But if it does come, a time when you really are feeling led to talk to someone about some wrong behavior in their life, then you need to do it with humility and gentleness and love. And it takes wisdom to do that. It takes wisdom. And your verse sheet, um, Ephesians 4, this is Paul talking in verse, um, uh, verses 1 through 3. He says there, um, ur he urges us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Carefully consider your own life before you go speak to another. And if you do, treat them with gentleness, humility, love, and discernment. And verse 6 is definitely talking about discernment because this is talking about the unbelievers. What you say to the unbelievers, the good news of Jesus Christ. And it says you speak to them once again with that attitude of love and humility. Not with um, 
hostile, angry language. You, you aren't rude or offensive. And it takes wisdom before you tell the good news to an unbeliever. You need to be wise when you're presenting the truth to unbelievers. Be wise in that. Be wise in the situations and the words you use speaking to the unbelievers. Now, this may not sound easy to you. Having an attitude of humility and love and discernment and speaking to people and not worrying about things and uh, praying in secret, being salt and light in the world, loving our enemies. You know, nothing that Jesus has said so far is easy. In fact, it sort of seems impossible. And so how do we do this? How do we walk in righteousness? Well, Jesus tells us next in verse 7, we pray. Verse 7 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. And if you drop down um, to the end there in chapter 11, it's, I mean verse 11, he says, How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Ask, seek, knock. These verbs in the Greek are in the present tense, and so they mean continuous activity. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. That's what um, we need to do to walk in the kingdom with righteousness. And these three words combine to emphasize the truth that when you go to God with these desires, he will satisfy you. He will answer you. Why? Because he is good and he loves us. And he is our heavenly father, our intimate heavenly father. Jesus reminds them of this by calling him father and tells them he is good and he gives them that example who of you if their son comes and says give me a piece of bread would put a stone on their plate how much more will God in heaven give good things to those who ask him now it may not be immediately but keep asking keep seeking keep knocking with the desire to be in harmony with God's will and God will answer you and then the last verse in this section, verse 12, kind of sums up this whole section on attitude. It's commonly known as the golden rule. Let's read it here. Verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Now the interesting thing about this is that in many religions and belief systems, they have this rule. But it's said in the negative. You know, don't do what you don't want others to do to you. Kind of like don't hit your little brother if you don't want your little brother to hit you. But Jesus turns it around. He says it from the positive. He says take the initiative. Do good to others. The good you want them to do to you, do it first to them. Let it begin with you. One quote said, the golden rule is the foundation of active goodness and mercy, the kind of love God shows to us every day. This is what the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, is teaching. This is the true intent of the law, that active goodness and mercy. So ladies, to walk in righteousness, ask God for that right attitude. That attitude of goodness and mercy. That attitude of humility and gentleness and love and discernment. And now we come to the last section of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus tells us we must choose. We must choose. You must choose which righteousness you want. The righteousness of the Jewish religious leaders. And we've learned that was outward <clears throat> and hypocritical. It was external righteousness. And it was false righteousness. It wasn't righteousness at all. Or do we want true righteousness? That is that inward transformation of the heart that comes from God through faith in Jesus. And Jesus gives us four illustrations to help us make the right choice. First, he begins in verse 13 with two ways, two paths, two roads to be on. And you enter them through two different gates. And the first one is the um, wide gate and the way is easy and many enter that but it leads to death it leads to destruction the second gate is narrow and the path is hard and few will take it but Jesus says choose the narrow gate this is the path of true righteousness 
through the king, Jesus, and his kingdom. Jesus is saying this path leads to life. Choose Jesus. Now, you may have heard people say that there are many ways to God, many paths that um, get to heaven, or maybe they might even say, we all are going to heaven. And the truth is, ladies, that is not true. That is not true. There is only one way, and Jesus says, I am the way. On your verse sheet, John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to me, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then Jesus goes on to talk about false prophets. Don't listen to false prophets and don't be a false prophet. And you can spot them by their fruit. Let's look at verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? You can recognize a false prophet because um, their fruit will be bad. You don't get figs. From a thistle bush. And when it says fruit, it's talking here about their character and their conduct. False teachers will not be speaking the truth. False teachers will not have right motives. They won't be doing it unto the Lord. They're doing it for themselves, for either monetary gain or fame or um, power. And they won't have the right perspective. They're not looking for the eternal. They're looking for what right now is going to benefit them. And they don't have the right attitudes. They're not humble and gentle and loving, but they are prideful and arrogant. And they do not speak the words of Jesus. If you're not sure um, if you're listening to a false prophet or maybe reading a book that's false teaching, go to God and ask him for discernment. See if what they're saying is in line with the whole Bible or are they just taking some of the words of the Bible and then adding their own truth to it. Next, Jesus talks about those who do good things. They're not false prophets. Maybe they live moral lives and they give money and, per, um, and resources to worthy charities, but they do not have a personal relationship with Jesus. They don't really know Jesus and so on Judgment Day, Jesus says to them, I never knew you. You have no part in my kingdom. You know, ladies, it doesn't really matter what we've done, how hard we've tried, how much we've tried to be good. What matters is, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? Have you trusted in him as your Savior? This is how we become a citizen of the kingdom. One quote I read said, The basis for a person's final destination begins with the person's decisions about Jesus himself. Choose Jesus. Believe in Jesus. And then Jesus closes this Sermon on the Mount with this final parable of the two builders. Verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. So the wise man um, builds his house on the rock. The rains fell, the floods came, the winds, and the house stands. He is the wise man. Verse 26 says, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man. He builds his house on the sand, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against the house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Jesus says, the wise man is the one who listens to my words and does them. The foolish man listens, but he doesn't do them. They were both listening, but it's the wise man who does the words of Jesus. So as he's finishing all these words, all these things about the kingdom of God, and he's saying, when you leave, you've listened to all this. Follow me. Do what I say. That is wisdom. And that's what we want to do, ladies. Follow him. Obey him. And then we finish up here with verse 28. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. And the word there in the Greek means astounded. It means very, very amazed. They just sat there speechless. They'd never heard anyone teach like this before. They'd never heard anything like it. Verse 29 says, For he was teaching them as one who had authority, 
not as their scribes. Those were the religious teachers of the day. Jesus was teaching with authority. So as we close, ladies, and we think about these words, choose Jesus, follow him, obey him, and let Jesus the King be the authority in your life. Let's pray. Oh, Father, how, how glad we are for these words of Jesus that tell us how we are to be in the kingdom of God. Father, we choose you and we want to follow you. And I just pray, Lord, that these ladies in this room would be touched by your words right now. And Father, it's hard. It's hard. And so we just ask that you would give us what we need to walk this path. Because we love you, Lord. Bless these ladies. In Jesus' name, amen.